In this video, I will provide you with an example for nailing requirements according to the building code book for anyone who is planning on raising a ceiling joist or rafter tie. And of course, this wasn't a building code I was familiar with when I was working as a carpenter. So there is a building code chart that has a nailing schedule to connect the rafter tie or ceiling joist to the roof rafter that will provide you with an amount of nails you will be required to use. However, if you raise the roof rafter tie, then you will need to add a few more nails. And there's another chart on that. And that's what this video is going to attempt to explain. And if I use the one chart 2308.7.3.1, and I look up a 4 and 12 roof pitch with a span between 12 and 24 feet, and everything is spaced 24 inches on center, then I'm going to need eight 16 common nails. And that's what we have here eight nails at both ends of the rafter tie. And hopefully I read that chart right. If not, we're going to use eight in our example. So let's go ahead and tilt this roof into position and then add a box with our measurement. Now we're going to be measuring from the top of the framing plate, the top of whatever the roof rafter is going to be sitting on top of to the bottom of the roof ridge. And this is the measurement that we're going to use to calculate our fractions like one third, one quarter, one sixth, whatever is required. And the measurement for that will be three foot 11 or 47 inches. And we're going to raise our roof rafter tie seven inches, which is going to put us in the one sixth category. So if I divide 47, 47 inches, the overall height by six, I should end up with 7.833 inch increments to create six individual increments that will all be the same size and representing one sixth of the overall height. And let's go ahead and zoom in on it here. Seven inches, putting us in between the one-tenth and the one-sixth increments. And I went ahead and scaled all of these measurements to see if I can provide you with a little more information if you're not quite wrapping your mind around it. So anything less than one-tenth is going to fall into this category. Anything less than one-sixth into this category here, one fifth into this area, one quarter in this area, and one third, which is usually going to be the maximum height you're allowed to raise a rafter tie, will fit in between these two lines here. So if I raised this eight inches instead of seven inches, I would be in the one fifth area, and that might require a few more nails. And to calculate the amount of extra nails you're going to need, that's not that difficult. You're just simply going to look at the chart and then take the original amount of nails required for the connection, which in our case is going to be 8. And then I'm simply going to multiply that one by 1.2 to give us 9.6. And you're going to probably have to round up on all of these, even though it didn't say that in the building code book, meaning that for our example here, we're going to have to add two more nails for a total of 10 nails. Nails. And if we're dealing with the one third area, we're just simply going to take eight, multiply it by 1.5, the number that we can find in the building code book to provide us with 12. It will require 12 16D common nails to connect the rafter tie or ceiling joist to the roof rafter at each end of the rafter tie. And hopefully that makes sense. Now the second part of the video will provide you with a little more information about the nailing requirements for when the rafter tie or ceiling joist is sitting on top of the framing plate. Here is another one of those rules that most home builders and framing carpenters aren't really aware of. And I don't think I knew about it until I was in my 30s. And it has to do with rafter ties or ceiling joist. And this would be with any connection to the roof rafter or any laps that you're going to have between the ceiling joist or the rafter ties. And that's going to be the amount of nails required per connection. And according to one of the charts I found, this could be anywhere between three 16D common nails 
and 51 16D common nails. And a common nail is larger than a sinker. And with that being said, the more nails you put into a piece of wood, the greater the chances it's going to split. And I really don't know where the thinking is behind something like this, but I can tell you that you can install the nails on both sides if you need to, and you can use larger lumber if you need to. If you need to put 51 nails into a roof rafter and a rafter tie or ceiling joist, you're probably going to need 2x12s for both of them. Now, how do you find out how many nails you're going to need? Simply go to your favorite search engine and type in the words ceiling, joist, and rafter tie connections. And it should take you to a chart. And in the chart, you're going to look for your rafter slope, how far apart the rafter ties or ceiling joist are going to be spaced or their on-center spacing, then the live load or the snow loads, and then the span of the building. And to provide you a couple of examples, if I had a 3 and 12 roof pitch, and I was going to space my rafter ties 48 inches on center for a regular roof without a snow load or a live load only, on a building with a 12 foot or less span, I would need 10 16D common nails per connection. If that building was going to be between 12 and 24 feet, I would need 20 nails. And this is where it goes all the way up to 51 nails. If I was going to space my ceiling joists or rafter ties 48 inches on center, I would need 51 nails per connection if my building was going to be 36 feet wide. However, if I was going to space them 16 inches on center, on a 36 foot wide building. I could reduce that from 51 to 17 nails per connection. Next up, let's go ahead and take a look at strongbacks, another thing that you're gonna be dealing with when using rafter ties without ceiling joist. Any strongback is nothing more than a piece of wood that is used to prevent another piece of wood from moving or moving as much. So a strong back in this case that's used in a garage with rafter ties is going to do two things. It's going to prevent the rafter tie from moving to the right or the left and uh, in some cases prevent it from sagging too much. You know, if you just have a 20 foot long two by four and uh, you just put it up in your garage, wouldn't be hard to imagine this two by four sagging uh, in the middle, you know, kind of the weight of it, the board is just going to force it down. With the strong back, that's going to help, uh, you know, because the strong back can actually sag. You know, if you have a 20 foot by 20 foot garage, 20 foot long two by four in this direction, 20 foot long two by four in this direction, there's a good chance that uh, in the middle of the garage, it's going to be sagging, especially if you store stuff up there also. So one way that you can connect them together would be through some building hardware like this. I believe these are hurricane ties. Something like this would work out great. And uh, give it a nice tight connection. Um, something like this, um, you know, might work fine. You know, I think I would use the other uh, method. But again, I'm just kind of throwing this out there. This looks like it will work. And of course... This is actually the most common method you're going to find. And that would be a carpenter just simply driving a nail, a 16D nail, on each side of the um, collar tie into the rafter tie. And you're probably thinking, oh, this, this isn't going to do much. But if we take a look at it through an x-ray uh, view, you can see here what kind of creates... Um, something that isn't going to allow a lot of movement. And I'm not saying that these, um, that the rafter ties can't separate from the uh, strong backs. Not saying that at all. I've seen, them, I've seen them separate too many times. But this method right here, kind of creating a crisscross, does create a nice connection. Um, and, uh, and again, I've, came, I've worked on a lot of houses and uh, that have had situations exactly like this. And you'll see one of the 
um, rafter ties is separated about a half inch or something from the collar tie and the one next to it is still tight um, you know so if you have a situation like this um, you might have one or two that have separated a half of an inch and the rest of them are still tight um, to the board so they, it, it is a good connection it's just not going to be as good of a connection as using a hurricane tie now if you are looking for something a little stronger then um, use a larger piece of wood you know here we have a two by six instead of a two by four this is going to give you provide you with you know a little more strength if you're worried about the board's um, ceiling joists or the rafter ties sagging down this isn't going to provide you with much of a difference to prevent the um, ceiling joist from moving right to left kind of a thing and that should make sense now if you have a big sag in the ceiling and again this wouldn't be um, something you would probably need for rafter ties but if you have ceiling joist then a beam a larger piece of wood is probably going to be a little better than a smaller piece of wood and again you can always you know you can double these up you can use a uh, you know depending upon the span if you have a 20 foot span then um, you might need something like a 4x10 you know I think here I have a 4x8 and I'm just kind of giving you an idea how you can use a hanger to connect it over here um, to if you had a situation like this and of course if you use a large enough beam for your strong back and of course this might not be uh, referred to as a strong back anymore it might be a, a structural beam um, then you could always use it to support the roof if you're having problems with the roof rafters sagging and that might be a more common situation in a building with two by four roof rafters or even longer spans with two by six um, roof rafters and in our last example I will show you how a strong back can be used to replace blocking in a two by four um, floor truss system like we have here and I know a lot of people think they can put a board in here and I'm not saying you can't and uh, you know it's going to prevent the floor trusses from sagging and I just don't buy it uh, you know it uh, might help a little but I don't know how much it would really help in the end and of course it would all depend upon the situation you know if you have a floor truss like we have here I think we're looking at 30 foot wide you know you put a two by four down the center I don't think it's going to be doing much you know if it's a floor truss that's um, you know 10 foot wide and you put a 2 by 12 down the center of something like this might make a difference so I hope that makes sense other than that the 2 by 4 or whatever you're using for your um, strong back and again these are blocking instead of blocking the trusses these are going to prevent them from moving to from the right or the left kind of a thing and uh, um, and they actually would if you didn't put them in you're going to have them turning you know the bottom of it could actually turn to the right or turn to the left I've seen that happen before so and again I always check with the product manufacturer before um, uh, you know thinking that everything I say in all of my videos is going to work for every single project probably not going to happen and here we have the um, strong backs lapping and some of them you might need to lap on, lap them a little farther they might need to connect to three or four trusses and here I just have them lapping to um, to one on each side kind of a thing so that is it for the video by now you should have a pretty good idea what a strong back is used for we normally see them in ceilings that is going to be the number one use for them but as I suggested in the video they can be used make them a little larger and uh, if you can you know a, a hip roof is also going to create problems for you with your um, strong backs because you're not going to be able to set them you might you might have to connect it to a rafter where you won't be able to set it on top of a wall and then that's going to be creating more of an issue for the roof rafter you know when you start putting a lot of weight on it so larger boards you know if you're going to flatten out a ceiling um, you know you got a plastered ceiling with two by fours or two by six and you want to flatten it out you might need um, you know just a two by six just might not cut it 
especially on larger spans, a span over 12 feet. You know, you might need a two by eight, something like that, or or two two by eights nailed together or a four by eight.